Here you see an example of a forklift crane lifting a cage. Notice how the forks stay level even though the rest of it moves. We're going to do an example of this forklift crane. So first I'm going to go over kind of all the links and joints so you have an idea of what's happening and then we'll analyze it mathematically. So looking at this forklift, um, we can see that there are a few hydraulic cylinders. So we have this cylinder right here, which will raise and lower the boom. So it's connected with revolute joint on each end. It has a prismatic joint in the center. Um, then there's another cylinder here, which can tilt the forks. So that was a little hard to see, but we've got that. And then now back here, we've got another cylinder. This doesn't actually affect the motion of the machine. What it does is sort of act as an accumulator because um, in order to keep the forks level as the crane goes up and down, then this green cylinder here will soak up all of the volume of oil that's leaving this cylinder here at the top. So as fluid comes out of this top cylinder, it goes into the bottom cylinder, which allows it to keep the forks level without spilling any oil. So now looking at the rest of it, um, we have the body here, which we're going to ignore the fact that the wheels move, just assume this is parked. So we've got the ground. And then we've got the boom of the crane. So we'll have a joint there. And this goes all the way up to the top. And as kind of like that L shape. So we'll note that um, it has one of the red cylinders connected to it on the bottom, one of the red cylinders connected to it at the top. Um, and also right here is actually, it's a prismatic joint. So the crane can extend and retract like that. Um, and then finally, we have part of the, the forks which are connected there. So if we count up all of the links and all of the joints here, um, we'll start with links, do that in gray. So the ground is one, and then we've got two for each cylinder. So two, three, actually that color is really hard to see. One, two, three, and we're not gonna count this little green cylinder because that one's not an actuator, it's just an accumulator, so it doesn't affect the motion. Um, so then the boom will have links four and five because we have the, the holder and then the part that extends out. And then we've got the second cylinder at the top, six, seven, and then finally the forks are the eighth link. So L equals eight. Now we need to figure out how many joints there are. So look at joints in yellow. Um, so joints, we've got prismatic joints, one, two, three. So joints equals, we'll figure out three, prismatic and how many revolute. Um, so each cylinder is attached at the end. So we've got four, five, six, seven, and then one here, eight, for the boom, and then up at the top where the forks are connected, nine. So nine joints total. 
three prismatic joints, six revolute. So now we can use this to figure out how many loops we need and what is the mobility of the mechanism. Now, judging based on the actuators, we should have three degrees of freedom because we have the retraction and extension of the boom. Let's write this down. Three degrees of freedom. So one is the boom, which retracts and extends. Two, so that's length. Two is the boom angle. So that is the bottom red cylinder. And then three is the fork angle. Now, if we want the forks to stay level, that will actually remove a degree of freedom. So um, then we would cross this one out. And actually if, um, yeah, so that will cross that one out. So then the boom extension is kind of independent of the operation of the two loops. So um, for the purposes of inputs to solving mechanism loops, we would just need to focus on the two cylinders. Now let's figure out how many loops do we actually need here. So looking at this, there's a bottom loop and there's a top loop. So we should have two loops, but we'll do the equation L equals J minus L plus one equals nine minus eight plus one equals two. So two loops, one for the bottom cylinder, one for the top cylinder. And then we'll calculate the mobility of this. So M equals three times L minus one minus two J. So that is gonna be three times seven minus two times nine equals three. So that gives us our three degrees of freedom. Now we'll have to note that when we actually do the math for this, if we wanna keep the forks level, that's going to remove one of those degrees of freedom. So now let's analyze this mathematically. We're gonna start out by assigning a coordinate frame and then a vector to every link. Then after that, we will figure out knowns, unknowns, inputs, constraints, and then work out position, velocity, and acceleration analysis. So this is a machine because it has actuators. There is um, this red cylinder up at the top controlling the fork angle. There is the prismatic joint of the boom of the crane, and then there is this black cylinder at the bottom that adjusts the angle. Now, this red cylinder in the back at the bottom does not act as an actuator. It's just an accumulator, so we're not going to count that with our loops and links and joints and stuff. That, that one doesn't matter. We're going to say that the truck is the ground. So here we're just going to ground all this, it's part, it's not moving. Um, so then let's put in a coordinate frame. So we'll put X in this bottom left corner. So our axis origin goes there and then we have X going to the right and Y going up. And then we need to put a vector on every link. So let's do something like this. So we have R0, R1, R2, R3. So kind of on the side of what that looks like. We have R1, R0, R3, R2. 
Okay, so then we'll do the top loop and let's do that one in red. Um, now here we have, say, R5, and then R6, and R7 points up. In general, if you can have something pointing up and to the right, it's easier because up and to the right are the positive directions of the axes. It just makes the math work out better. So we have these two loops. Now we need to figure out knowns, unknowns, inputs, and constraints. So um, looking at this, we'll write out known, unknown, and inputs. Now here, the, if you notice the length of the boom, the extension and retraction, like that, um, that's not affecting the loops. That affects how far the loops are apart from each other, but not how the loops actually move. So we're going to treat these as two different loops. Um, and each loop will need an input. We've got two cylinders. So we've got top cylinder, the bottom cylinder. So those will be our inputs. Say that is R2 is an input. Um, but then we'll have the constraint over these forks staying flat. So we'll, we'll wait to assign the inputs until we get the rest of that figured out. So first let's write down what we know. So knowns are items that you can, that stay constant. So you measure it at the beginning, they don't change the whole time. You automatically know what they are. So those would be, um, for the Rs, we'd have R0, R1, R3, R5, R7. So those are all constant lengths. Now, Angles, we'll know theta zero, it's just 90 degrees, theta one, that is zero degrees. And then we want this to stay level. So constraint of level forks, theta seven equals pi over two. So we'll know theta seven. So then unknowns would be anything that does change. So that is R2, theta two. And then what other angles change? Uh, theta three, theta five, theta six, R6, all those change. Well, we have two loops, so we'll get four equations out of that. So then we need some constraint equations and we need to figure out what is the input. Well, if we need the forks to stay level, then R6 is not necessarily going to be an input because we're not controlling the fork angle, we're just keeping it flat. So um, that will be necessitated through the constraint. So we're not gonna use R6 as an input. Now, let's see, R2, we are making that boom go up and down. So making that boom go up and down um, is done by R2. And so R2 is an input. So we'll put input R2. And then looking at some constraints, we can see here that there's a fixed angle of this boom where R5 and R3, so R3 points in that direction, there's some set angle between them, call that gamma. So we see angle of R3, angle of R5, so constraint. Is theta five equals theta three minus gamma. So that will combine theta three and theta five into one. 
um, as far as figuring out nodes and unknowns. Because if you if you know theta five, then you can figure out theta three or vice versa. So we we can do that equation separately from the from the two loops. So now let's write our loop equations. So the first loop, this will be the bottom loop. Um, if we go around the loop counterclockwise, we'll have minus R0 plus R1 plus R2 minus R3 equals zero. So then this, if we, now we need to write the second loop. The upper loop is, and we'll also go around that one counterclockwise. So minus R5 plus R6 plus R7 equals zero. And those are zero vectors, because zero and X, zero and Y. You start and end at the same point. So now we've got these two loop equations and we need to break it out into position components. So we do position scalars. We'll need x1, y1. So let's see, r0 only points in the y direction. So we'll put that here, minus r0, because it had a minus in front. And now r1 only points in the x direction. So we'll put that in the x equation, r1. And then the other two can have angles in x and in y. So let's add those in. And then the second loop will have x2, y2. And note that r7 is only going to go in the y direction. r5 and r6 have angles that go in x and y. So let's put those in. So these are the position equations. Now we're going to figure out velocity. You can see I've color coded the position equations, so it's a little bit easier to see. Um, the black variables are things that won't change. So when we take the time derivative of those, then it will be zero. Now the red variables change in length and change in angle. So we'll have to use product rule as well as chain rule when differentiating those. And then the blue ones only change angle, they don't change length. So theta three and theta five change, but R3 and R5 don't change. Whereas with the red ones, R2 and R6 change length and theta two and theta six change angle. So now let's work out those derivatives. So these are the velocity scalar equations. Now we need to put this in matrix form. So I'm going to color code them again to distinguish some of the variables a little bit more. So instead of having two reds, we'll have a red and a green. But before we do that, um, we need to note that 
theta five and theta three are related as we had with the constraint above. So if we take the derivative of that constraint, theta three dot equals theta five dot because gamma is a constant, it doesn't change. So we can go ahead in here and replace theta five dot with theta three dot because those two velocities are the same and it will help us cut down on the number of unknowns we need to put into the matrices. So we'll get matrix form, J theta dot equals B. So let's arrange that. So here's how the matrix form will be set up. We'll have J times theta dot equals B. So we need to fill these out. Now let's figure out theta dot is going to be the unknowns matrix. So those, uh, those will be theta two dot, and then theta three dot will go in ascending order. And then theta five dot we got rid of because it's the same as theta three. So the next is theta six dot. And then finally, we'll have R six dot because those were the unknowns and R2 is going to be our input. So now we just need to fill out the Jacobian matrix. So that will be the coefficients of all of the unknowns. So the first row will be from X1, second row will be from Y1, third row will be from X2, fourth row will be from Y2, those are all velocity, so we'll have all the dots. So we need to figure out what is the coefficient of each unknown in each equation. So now from the first one, we'll have the coefficient of theta two dot is negative R2 S2. So negative R2 S2 from the X1 dot, and then from the Y1 dot, we'll have R2 C2 being the coefficient of theta two dot. Um, the way the columns go, we'll have the theta two, theta three, theta six, and R six columns. So we'll set, we set it up like that. So now theta three dot, that's the blue one. So in that first row, we'll have plus R three S three, and then minus R three C three. Now theta six dot and R six dot do not show up in X one and Y one equations here. So those will simply be zeros filling out there. But we do have something left. We have that R two dot C two and R two dot S two. That's the input. So let's move that over here. And remember that when you move something to the other side of the equation, it changes sign. So we'll have negative R two dot C2, negative R2 dot S2. And then similarly, we can fill out the bottom half of the matrix with the X2 and Y2 dot equations. So let's go ahead and do that. So now we figured out velocity. Uh, remember that this big matrix here is the Jacobian. And so when we do acceleration, that matrix is not going to change for the matrix form of acceleration. We'll have J theta double dot equals BA for acceleration. Um, so we need to figure out, since J won't change, theta dot will become theta double dot. We need to get BA to do that, we need to differentiate the velocity equations. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, note that some of these terms are going to combine. So because when you do acceleration, um, you end up using product rule and chain rule for everything, pretty much you get about twice as many terms in ex the acceleration equations as you did in the velocity equations, because you'll have to use product rule and chain rule on every term in the velocity. So I'm going to do those out all color coded so y'all can see that. And then we'll talk about how we could combine those to simplify them.
So now we've got the scalars all written out for acceleration. And a couple of these terms can combine. So looking at the x1 double dot equation, we have a negative r2 s2 theta dot 2 from the red and one from the green. So that those two will combine. And then same thing for the one below it, r2 c2 theta 2 dot, r2 c2 theta 2 dot. So those will combine. So we'll have like, those would become negative 2 r2 dot s2 theta dot 2 and then a plus r2 c2 theta dot 2 from the y1 double dot equation. So a couple things can combine in the second loop equations as well. Um, so looking at the red and the green here, we've got a negative r6 dot s6 theta dot 6 there and there. So those will combine to be negative 2 r6 dot s6 theta dot 6. And same thing with the ones below it. Those will become 2 r6 dot c6 theta dot 6. So now looking at these, if we fill out the Jacobian matrix, several of these terms will disappear because they'll be in the Jacobian. And then the rest of those are going to go into the BA matrix. So this is going to become J times theta double dot. So all of the coefficients of those terms will go in the Jacobian and everything else that's left over will go into the B matrix. So now I'm going to cross out from the acceleration matrix anything that would go into the Jacobian. So we'll be able to see just what are the leftovers. So anything that's times a double dot here from theta 2, theta 3, theta 6, or R6, all of those terms will go into Jacobian. So let's cross those out. So now you see we've got a lot of them left over and those will all go into the BA matrix. So remember that the sign changes when you transfer things to the other side. So for the X1 double dot, we'll have R2 dot S2 theta dot two plus R2 C2 theta dot two squared minus r2 double dot c2 and the r2 double dot can stay in here because remember r2 was the input minus r3 c3 theta dot 3 squared and the rest of the rows will follow similarly so let's fill those out So that finishes off acceleration, where this is the A. This is theta double dot. So now let's look at a simulation of this. So you can see that those forks are staying level because of our constraint on theta 7. And then here, position, velocity, acceleration. So let's kind of look at these. Um, so getting the position one first. So here we're looking at position. 
Um, so we have time on the x-axis, position of the bottom cylinder, R2, on the y-axis, and then the unknown positions end up on the z-axis. Um, so now you notice here pretty much everything is increasing. All those angles were increasing. The length of the cylinder R6, that top one, is also increasing, but not as much or not as quickly. So, um, all right, so that looks fine. And you can see that theta 3, theta 4, theta 5, so theta 3 and theta 4 are the same thing because theta 4 is the angle of the boom. And uh, also, so theta 3 and then theta 5 is that angle here. So we had. So theta three, theta four, and then theta five goes here. So that'll be increasing at the same speed, the same rate, but it will be a lower value. And we can see that here, the purple one is lower. So now looking at velocity, then all those should, theta three, four, and five. So we cannot see the red or the yellow. And that's because they're both underneath the purple because all those angles had the same speed. Remember theta three dot equals theta five dot. So that kind of checks out. Also the speed of R6 is much lower than the others. And we remember that it wasn't increasing as quickly in the position plot. So that makes sense. Now looking at the acceleration plot, uh, you can see again that the purple is covering up the red and the yellow. So Theta three, four, and five all have the same acceleration as anticipated. And then you can see the other stuff in there too. So um, R6, even though it's on top here, if you notice the top is actually close to zero. So that has the lowest absolute value, which reflects what we saw in the position plot. 